All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Before we get started, I want to invite Joanna from the Colorado Trust to say a few words. Welcome everybody. Oh, this works very well. So for everybody who's here and everybody who's joining us uh, through Zoom, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. This is an event funded by the Colorado Trust. We're a philanthropic organization that looks the well-being for all Coloradans. And this event, the origins of this event is through one of our strategies, the Building and Bridging Power Strategy. We have 35 organizations as part of this cohort. And part of what we do is fund capacity building and the organizations get to determine how that capacity building is being used. And one of the things that they brought up to my predecessor, Noel, was the lack of information around social movements in Colorado that were being led by black indigenous people of color. And so at that point, Noel uh, partnered with Celeste Martinez and like three, almost four years ago, this is how uh, this began. So this is a labor of love that has taken many years. Many people have participated to make this happen today. So I wanna acknowledge obviously Celeste Martinez. I wanna acknowledge Wafa Said, our policy and event coordinator at the Colorado Trust. Alejandra Martinez, our, uh, Alejandra Hernandez, I'm sorry, Ale, our capacity building coordinator, and all of them work for many years to make today happen. And please know this is just the beginning. Celeste has a wealth of research and information and resources that she will make available to you in different ways. So this is just the beginning and we're very proud and happy to be able to support efforts like this in Colorado. Please know that these series are being recorded and they will be available for later time. So if you have people at work and people you want to share this with at a later time, you will be able to access those resources as well. So welcome again and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna, um, and thanks so much to the Trust for their support of this project. Um, as mentioned, my name is Celeste Martinez. I'm the founder and owner of Celestia Alegria, Igniting Joy Through Transformation. Um, and we have a couple of agendas as well as timeline handouts here at the front. Feel free to grab that to follow along or at least to take that with you as we leave um, as a resource for our time together. Um, so through my business, I offer a variety of different services, including life coaching for women of color, queer trans people of color, I'm also a facilitator and consultant, mostly with social justice and arts organizations um, here in Colorado, but of course in other areas across the country as well. And before becoming a consultant, I was a community organizer for about 10 years, um, both as a student um, when I was here actually at Regis, that's where I got my start, um, and then later with various nonprofits in the metro area. And all of this really informed my approach to this particular research project, um, because in that time, I was exposed to lots of different types of organizing models, power building models, and how we could build collective power to affect change um, and see the changes that we wanted to make happen in our community. Um, and so all of this has informed this project. Um, and just to share a little bit more, as Joanna mentioned, this has been a long arc of a project with the Colorado Trust. Um, but really, learning from our past can help shape us and our reality of the future. Learning from history is an antidote to individualism because this recognizes that our efforts for justice are intergenerational of who came before, who is now, and the generations to come. And in the fall of 2020, the Colorado Trust, Noel reached out to me to create a report for Building and Bridging Power in their grantee program. And one of the guiding questions was, what kind of organizing models are most co common here in our Colorado landscape? And in answering this question, the intent was for the Colorado Trust leading this grant program to be more informed so they could better support grantees, 
especially since several of the grantee organizations were developing or refining their organizing programs. Um, the approach I used to answer this question was which schools of thought are behind the majority of community organizing models in our state and why? And this resulted in explaining the origins of Solinsky's community organizing methodology because several of the most common models are either directly informed by this original methodology or are derived from this methodology. And this is not common solely to Colorado, but actually across the nation and nonprofit sector, because this trend is actually reflected in how Sal Linsky was able to establish credibility of his approach to community organizing and institutionalizing that as a profession in the nonprofit sector. So one of the ways that Alinsky actually furthered his credibility with his methodology was distinguishing his form of community organizing and power building as distinct from BIPOC-led social movements, even though some of those leaders were trained in his methodology. And this created a wedge between social movements and community organizing and how we learn about them. Um, in the academic sphere, but also in the greater community and how community organizers and community leaders have access to this information. Additionally, there has been a lot of intentional repression and that has been acknowledged by our US government um, of the stories of these movements. So it can make it difficult as well for us to really understand what happened um, during this period of time that we're gonna cover for today. Um, but all of this really brings us to the purpose of this series. The intention is that this historical and sociological research is to ensure that present and future generations of community organizers and leaders can draw inspiration from this research and center the stories of social movements led by Black, Indigenous, and people of color and how movements often collaborated and were in solidarity with one another in the fight for racial justice because that's also part of the myth too, in, in saying that these movements were happening in separate efforts, when really they spurred in different places, but they often collaborated a lot together and stood in solidarity with one another. Um, therefore, with the financial support of the Colorado Trust, I had the opportunity to develop two research papers, which informs this series. The first is the impacts of Solinsky's methodology um, on community organizing and BIPOC-led efforts. And the second is on BIPOC-led social movements in the US and Colorado. And so this series really focuses on that second paper. And so we will be covering tonight um, our conversation around civil rights in the Black Panther Party. But the paper also encompasses American Indian movement, the Chicano movement, and the San Luis land rights struggle that's unique here to Colorado. The paper goes through a national overview um, or kind of a synopsis of the history of how each one of these um, came to be, what are significant and key events, and what are some strategies and actions that we can learn from these power building efforts. And this is why we're here today, to learn about these various stories um, and to continue to seek inspiration of that. So along with that, we will be having a panel as part of our evening together. Um, this will come after I give a little bit of a lecture around civil rights and the Black Panther Party. Um, and our panelists who we have here today are Hasira Sola Shimu and Jamika Lewis. I will share more about them when we get to the time of our panel, um, but they have a wealth of knowledge and lived experience that they can speak to as it relates to these social movements. And so we're very grateful to have them with us today. Um, with that, there's a lot to cover, so I'm just gonna dive Right in. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with civil rights. Um, for each of our movements, we're gonna talk about the conditions that inspired the movement. Um, what then were some of those key uh, uh, leaders and events and actions, and then move into what are some strategies that we can learn from that. So when we think about the conditions that inspired the civil rights movement, we have to talk about these four main areas. And there's much more that can be talked about, but this is the summary that I want to bring to you all. First, we have to recognize that the transatlantic slave trade and chattel slavery of African people in the US 
contributed as a major factor as to why the civil rights movement emerged. Second is a concept around racial extermination, which I'll further break down in a moment. And the other is legal discrimination of black Americans. Um, there were laws known as the Black Codes and later Jim Crow, and we're gonna cover all of that. Um, and then lastly, post-World War I, there was a migration of black Americans from the rural southeastern part of the US to north and western cities. And all of these conditions then created um, what was necessary to spur the movement that is known as civil rights, also sometimes referred to as the freedom movement. So what is chattel slavery? What do we mean by the transatlantic slave trade? Well, the transatlantic slave trade was in existence as a product of colonization, which was an economic system established by various European countries that depended on free to no cost labor in order to sustain it as an economic system. And um, the solution then that was derived and how to have um, continual workforce was through chattel slavery and the plantation system. And so today I want to define what is chattel slavery from the way that Dr. Joy Degree, the author of Post-Traumatic Slavery Disorder, describes that chattel slavery is an enslaved person who is owned forever and whose children and children's children are automatically enslaved. These are individuals treated as complete property to be bought and sold. And what's important to acknowledge is that here in the United States, chattel slavery was legal and part of the foundation of how our country was built. And this spanned from 1619 to 1865. I also want to acknowledge though, that there were people who continued to experience chattel slavery and there's documentation of that well into the 1960s, even this time period um, that we're describing around the civil rights movement. And so when we look at this span of time, this is 246 years, at least for this time period of when slavery was legal in the United States. And I want us to think about how this period of time actually impacted seven generations. Seven generations of people who were enslaved, as well as people who were um, slave masters, as well as people who were participants in this entire system. And in that, and in part of the work of Dr. Joy Degree in Post-Traumatic Slavery Disorder, she talks about how everyone has been affected and infected by the trauma of chattel slavery, as well as those who imposed it in a multi-generational way. And because there has been no intervention, and even at the federal level, a lack of recognition of the significant period of time of history, this has continued to create means of trauma that we see in our society, in our collective culture here in the US. One of the ways that that is expressed is through this second aspect that I would like to define for us as racial extermination. This comes from the work of K. Wright Lewis, um, who is the author of A Curse Upon the Nation, Freedom and Extermination in America and the Atlantic World. And the way that I would like to define this is that racial extermination is a a forcible deadly violence used by masters to make enslaved live in constant state of fear and reinforce dominant power, which then creates racial tension and anxiety between white and black Americans. And when we describe what this violence is, this is violence that was enforced through beatings, both publicly and in private, intimidation, police brutality, lynchings, church bombings, and there's many others. But this continual state of violence was in order to reinforce power and dominance over those who were enslaved. And this types of violence continued well after slavery was abolished in our country. And it's something we still see in its expressions today. I mean, even in our recent events, we can see that there were people trying to attack some of our black neighbors in the South just earlier this week. And so in all of this, what's important to understand is that the reason that racial extermination is a central tenet of racial control is that it has been obstructed to one side where white people stood to gain from its usage in particular and yet ever-changing ways over time. And so ideas about race and freedom allowed for unobstructed violence to ensue against black people who resisted against slavery 
and the Civil War, as well as Reconstruction era, and well throughout Jim Crow as well. And so this then brings us to legal discrimination. Legal discrimination expands well before this timeline, but for the sake of our conversation, I wanna invite us to consider it here. After the US Civil War, which was from 1860 to 1865, the legal end to chattel slavery was then announced across the US. And there were laws that were set into place that allowed for legal discrimination against black Americans, especially in the Southeast region of the United States immediately after. These are known as the black codes, um, which again, legally justified discrimination. Um, and in 1866, the Civil Rights Act was passed by Congress, granting legal citizenship for the first time to black men. In 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson was upheld by the US Supreme Court, justifying segregation laws by state and local government. So what we're seeing is this constant conversation from our national, federal government to our local and state governments on how black Americans should be treated. And more often than not, um, the support was for discrimination to continue to be justified. And the last factor that contributed to this movement is that post-World War I, there was a migration of black Americans from the rural southeastern regions of, region of the United States to the north and to the western cities. And this largely was due be to the lack of work that was accessible and available, as well as opportunities that was available because of the forms of legal discrimination and other forms of violence the black community was continuing to face. And this time period is often referred to as the Harlem Renaissance from 1920. So all of these various conditions inspired and spurred what emerged and is known as the civil rights movement. And so now um, we're gonna highlight who are some of those key leaders, organizations, and a timeline of particular events for us to understand this. Bless you. <clears throat> so in 1909, the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, known as the NAACP, was founded to abolish all forms of legal segregation and discrimination against black people. Later in 1942, the Congress of Racial Equality, also known as CORE, was founded by James Farm Farmer, Bernice Fisher, and several others in Chicago, Illinois. When it comes to the research that I conducted, we did a deeper dive on CORE because that is relevant to the history of our, the connection around civil rights here in Colorado. In 1955, um, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man in Montgomery, Alabama, and was arrested beginning the Montgomery bus boycott. And this is recognized um, at times as the first major um, collective action of the civil rights movement. In 1957, um, then there were two um, key things that happened. In January, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, established a black ministers after the success of the Montgomery boycott um, emerged and appointed Martin Luther King Jr. as their president, which is part of why we continue to see Martin Luther King Jr. as such a huge figurehead when it comes to civil rights, is that he had a very public and um, position of leadership when it came to the civil rights movement. In August of that year, Central High School integrated with nine black students commonly referred to as a Little Rock Nine, attending formerly all-white school for the first time in Little Rock, Arkansas. And this was actually as a result to um, Brown versus the Board of Education, which is the Supreme Court case that overturned the legal discrimination of separate but equal. Um, however, this is an important action to acknowledge because this was one of the first schools to be integrated and there was a lot of organizing around the Little Rock Nine to be able to integrate into their school. And they constantly faced many threats of violence just to go to school every single day. And later on, their school was even closed, um, forming a bunch of private schools in Little Rock, Arkansas, that now exist still to today as a result to continue a form of segregation. In 1960, on February 1st, the first sit-in by four black men at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina began what is referred to as the sit-in movement. This was a strategy used in order to occupy spaces where there was legal discrimination to assert 
and a nonviolent means of direct action that black people and people of color should be included in these spaces. And in April of the same year, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also referred to as SNCC, was founded in Raleigh, North Carolina. In 1961, CORE established 53 affiliated chapters throughout the country and mostly in the north and western regions of the U.S., including a Denver CORE chapter. What's interesting about this is that what we can see as far as the impact of migration of Black Americans to the north and west is that there's a response to this and in, in the sense of the presence of CORE. And what's important to understand about CORE as an organization is that it was an interracial organization um, that continued to train people around nonviolent direct action. And they also played a lot of other roles that were very significant to the efforts in the South and oftentimes would encourage their members to participate in actions such as the Freedom Summer um, or other types of actions such as the March to Montgomery and all of that you can find in the timeline handout in more detail. But let's talk about Denver's connections um, to um, this history as well. There's history that predates um, the actions of our Denver core chapter with the Cosmopolitan Club, which again, you can find on our timeline handout, but for the sake of today, we're just gonna focus um, on this aspect of Denver's history. In 1962, um, the Denver core chapter protested Denver Dry Goods, which is a business on 16th Street um, with a very influential business leader, and they were successful in picketing this uh, business to hire um, black folks and people of color to, for more than just janitorial positions. And part of their strategy of doing this was to target the most influential business of the area so that way they could have the biggest effect. And they were successful. Um, they continued to use picketing as one of their main strategies in boycotting. And in 1963, they targeted Safeway on 20th in North Washington. And then Zone Cab Company, again, demanding that there be inclusive hiring practices for black and people of color. Um, and they were really creative in these strategies. Um, for Safeway, they would pick it outside of the grocery store so people would have to have a conversation with them as they would go buy their groceries for the week. Um, they also circulated in the, in the black newspaper as well as um, opinion pieces in the more public well, white newspaper at the time. And for the Zone Cab Company um, campaign, uh, the leaders actually used a variety of creative strategies where they would call to request black drivers. Um, but because Zone Cab Company really um, attributed itself and prided itself on being white only drivers, they would never be able to meet those requests. And they also went and picketed at the airport and did, passed out leaflets to people informing them about the discriminatory practices of the Zone Cab Company. And they were actually very successful in deterring a lot of business from them, which is ultimately why they included fair hiring. Um, a few other national efforts that sometimes are referred to as the end of the civil rights movement, but definitely is not the end of the civil rights movement, um, are these two specific laws that were passed. In July of um, 1964, um, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson, which mandated the desegregation of public spaces, including lunch counters, buses, parks, and swimming pools, established an Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to ensure the fair treatment of minorities in the workplace, and guaranteed voting rights of Black Americans. What's important to understand about the passage of this law, as well as the next one in 1965, that was passed as the Voting Rights Act, overturning state and local laws that prevented black Americans from exercising the right to vote, is that these laws were passed because of the pressure that was put from the actions and tactics that were continually happening in the South, as well as other areas across the country. Um, and so that direct power building um, had an effective change on our, on our federal landscape. So what are some strategies and actions we can learn from the civil rights movement? Well, first, um, one of their main um, courses of strategy was training all of those who were affiliated with them in nonviolent direct action. Um, the core chapter here in Denver, as well as throughout the core chapters throughout the country, required that people made a commitment to nonviolence as part of their ethic and their politics. 
Um, and so some of the strategies that they would use, right, again, was picketing, boycotts, sit-ins. The other aspect that we can learn from is that faith communities were strategically organized. Um, we see that with the SCLC. Oftentimes, ministers would um, preach about the issues impacting community and these types of action opportunities. Sometimes they would use worship as an opportunity for folks to receive training around um, these, these various aspects. The other is that there was a geographic focus of these campaigns. Each one of these um, major actions that really then helped to swell and spur more power building was a localized effort. Sit-ins started in a localized way in North Carolina. The bus boycott was focused in Montgomery, right? We see other things like such as that, where there's a specific focus on a strategic area with publicity around it in order to continue to apply pressure and power. The other um, stra uh, actions that were effective are marches, speeches, and again, a huge focus on civic engagement and voting rights as central to this particular movement. All right, so this all brings us now to the Black Panther Party, which in its timeline overlaps and how it emerged. So what were some of the conditions that inspired the Black Panther Party? Well, again, we see, well, one of the conditions was uh, the migration of Black Americans post-World War I um, into the North and Western cities. Um, this actually then established many neighborhoods that are, were referred to as Black neighborhoods because of legal discrimination and not so legal discrimination. There were many um, types of areas and neighborhoods that were affirmed solely for Black community also known as red line communities. And in this, there was um, ways that police brutality was increased in city environments towards black Americans. One of the results that we see and that inspired the founders of the Black Panther Party to create their, their organization was the Watts rebellions in Los Angeles, California um, from August 11th through 16th. Um, and what's interesting is this is shortly after, right, the voting threat was passed. But what happened here is that the Watts Rebellion started after Marquette Frey was arrested by a white police officer. He used excessive force during the arrest and confrontations then between black neighborhoods in central and south Los Angeles. And the police resulted in the death of 34 people with over a thousand people injured. What's important to understand is that this result or this type of rebellion was because there was such severe police brutality happening and constant unjust arrests and murders of black people in their community. And so this was a time where people began to really fight back. Um, and it's a significant event that inspired many people across the country, including the co-founders of the Black Panther Party, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, who in 1966 first established the Black Panther Party first known as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And when they established this, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale originally met one another because they were community college students who were engaged in various political groups in Oakland. And they felt like a lot of the groups that they were a part of were all talk and no action. And so after the Watts rebellions and being witnesses to that, and seeing the constant police brutality that they were facing in their own community in Oakland, they were eager to seize the moment. And Newton um, was actually studying law, and he, beyond his school assignments, wanted to further study law. And in doing so, he really began to study what his rights were, and not just his federal rights, but what were his rights at the state and local level. And what he realized is that in, at that period of time, in the state of California, it was legal to bear open arms, to carry a gun. And initially, this was a means of how um, Huey Newton and Bobby Steele agreed that they could actually recruit other members in their community was by showing that they could defend themselves against the police brutality that their community was constantly facing. Another significant event is 1977. From January to September, there were 164 rebellions against police brutality in neighborhoods, black neighborhoods across the US. 
Now, while this is not a specific action that was directed by the Black Panther Party, it's important to recognize this because this created the conditions then that many um, chapters described as part as to why they wanted to establish themselves in allegiance and alignment with the Black Panther Party. On April 1st of that year, Denzel Dowell was brutally murdered by Oakland police and a, at, and a first rally was held by the Black Panther Party outside of a neighborhood liquor store. This was a rally that swelled to hundreds of participants shutting down the street and they were successful in having their rally and not having it interrupted by police because they were exercising their rights um, and, and um, really captivating their community to become engaged. And that's how they initially recruited many different members. On April 25th, they circulated the first um, Panther paper in Oakland and shared the news about the police murder of Denzel Dowell. And newspapers continued to be an important source for the Black Panthers and how they dispelled information locally in Oakland and then later across the country. In 1967, uh, oh, sorry. Um, also in 1967, on May 2nd, the Black Panthers um, led a delegation as an action of 24 men and six women bearing arms to the, to the California State Capitol in Sacramento, California. And this action that they took received mass media coverage where they actually shared their 10 core demands and the 10 core needs that was behind their organization. The reason why they did this action is that there was a state legislature, state legislator who was attempting to repeal that law that they could publicly bear arms. And overall, the California state legislator agreed that they would uh, repeal that law. And while their initial recruitment tactic was gone, what was powerful of that moment is that the Black Panthers were effective at sharing their message and resonating with people, not just in Oakland, but across the country in the action that they took. And this then later would inspire the Black Panthers to grow. Um, on October 28th, Oakland police officer John Frere pulled over Huey Newton and Jean McKinney, resulting in a violent altercation that led to Newton becoming a primary suspect uh, for the death of Frey. What's important to understand here too about Newton, who was the head of the Black Panthers at this time, or sat as the chairman at this time, is that the, the Black Panthers were, again, very strategic um, to hone the moment um, and figure out how they were going to take action. And they described how in this, while there was no proof of uh, how Officer Frey died, um, the blame went to Huey Newton, right? And so there was a way that they were able to amplify this message of how um, this was relevant to the ways that Black community was unjustly being put on trial, making it um, a public trial of America. This is one of the ways that they spinned it around. Um, in 1968, the Panther Papers began to circulate nationally, so from Oakland and now nationally. What we also see is that the FBI counterintelligence program, known as Quintel Pro, expanded its field offices to 44 new offices by the request of President Hoover, who, was, who really wanted to repress all efforts of civil rights organizations and the Black Panther Party. Also in the same year, on February 17th, the Black Panther Party announced their merger with SNCC. And this really established their leadership in the movement for Black liberation and Black power, um, as well as providing further credibility in this strategic, strategic alignment. On April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. And on April 6th, little Bobby Hutton was murdered by Oakland police. What's interesting about this is that, they're, first of all, their deaths are very close together. Second of all, they were both assassinated. And the way that the narrative was about each of their deaths was very different and, dis and distinct. For Martin Luther King, we often hear that he's a murderer, a martyr, sorry, a martyr for our civil rights and our liberties, that he is really a martyr for America. And that was intentional because um, the president's office at that time really wanted to control the narrative about who Martin Luther King was so he could be more palatable for the public. 
Um, but what we know is that Martin Luther King Jr. was aligning himself with more black power led organizations towards the time when he was assassinated. And little Bobby Hutton was one of the three original founding members of the Black Panther Party. Um, and so the ways that the Black Panthers organized around little Bobby Hutton is that they shared that he was a martyr for black liberation, not um, in the same way as the same narrative of Martin Luther King. But that message really resonated with many black Americans, especially young people at the time, um, and inspired them to then replicate what the Panthers were doing in Oakland, in their home cities, and in their communities. On June 15th, the Panthers hosted a rally with 2,500 supporters outside the courthouse on the first day of Huey Newton's trial. And again, they, they put America on trial. And so this was a way for folks to nationally organize their support. In 1969, the Black Panthers had expanded their chapters to 68 cities across the country. David Hillard became the chairman of the Black Panther Party and the National Central Committee. Um, and Hillard supported the expansion of community programs that led, lo led by local chapters to meet the direct needs of Black communities. Oftentimes, how Black Panther Party chapters would establish further trust in their, um, in their local community was offering direct services that were needed for their community. One of the services that was commonly offered amongst many chapters, including the one here in Denver, was free breakfast for students, um, black students going to school, um, because one of the things that they constantly heard is that children were hungry. Um, and the efforts of this type of direct service program actually has influenced um, at the federal level for us to create free breakfast programs as well as free and reduced lunch. Um, so you can thank the Panthers for that, as well as many other um, areas that they would uh, really focus their services on. Um, a few other important events here is that on May 17th, George Sams, George Sams, who was an FBI informant, infiltrated the Black Panther Party um, chapter of New Haven and manipulated local members with false orders from Bobby Seale to torture and later, later kill a Black Panther member, Alex Rackley, and these events resulted in the arrest of Bobby Seale and other New Haven Panthers. And in May, later that month, the national student strikes swelled across the country to raise awareness of Black Panther political prisoners because this type of infiltration, with this example in New Haven, Connecticut, was, sim was similar to that of efforts of the FBI in many areas across the country. And so many Panthers were being targeted by police and by the FBI, and were unjustly incarcerated by false accusations. And so the national student strikes included 4 million students at 1,300 colleges, participating with 1.5 million students of that original 4 million who remained on strike through the rest of their school year, and they effectively shut down 536 colleges. And they did so because they wanted to show their solidarity and support of the Black Panthers and what they were fighting for. In 1970, um, and by January, um, the Black Panther Party was receiving $100,000 monthly in small donations. These are people giving a dollar, $20, right, um, out of their pocket. And the reason why I name this is that power is organized people, money, and ideas. And really, the Black Panthers had it all. They knew how to organize people around their core beliefs and demands, and they also knew how to organize money to sustain their work as an organization. Um, all of it was filtered through the National Central Committee, and this did later lead to, some, uh, lead to some tensions between local chapters and the National Committee. But what's important is that they were effective at doing it, and there's a lot that we can learn from that grassroots power. On August 5th, um, Huey Newton was released from prison and resumed the role of chairman of the Black Panther Party and the National Central Committee. When Newton was released from prison at this time, he was very different than when he entered in, at least that's the way that it's articulated in many different sources. And so was his uh, understanding of how he wanted to lead the party. And so as a result, um, by September, there was a strategy to actually dissolve a series of chapters because he felt um, that many of the chapters were not necessarily 
accountable enough or that there wasn't enough communication to really understand the local efforts that were happening and how to continue to be in strategic alignment. So the Denver chapter, as well as many others, were then replaced with the National Committee to Combat Fascism. And that was created as a coalition after the national student strikes happened. Um, the other aspect to that that's interesting is that you can find more information in the University of Denver archives specifically on this committee. All right, so this brings us to the Denver Black Panther chapter. In 1968, Lauren Watson founded the chapter here in Denver after meeting Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. At the time, he worked for the Black newspaper, community newspaper, and went to interview both Huey Newton and Bobby Seale about what they were doing and was so inspired that he came back um, and founded a chapter. There was a lot of other context that um, we have folks here to speak to, to about you know, his other sources of inspiration, but that um, was a very significant event. In 1969, the Denver Black Panthers led a campaign to free political prisoners, Rory Hilf and Landon Williams, established a liberation school and a free breakfast program. The liberation school was for um, young black people to learn about their history outside of school. Um, on March 1st, the Black Panthers took action in solidarity with the West High walkouts led by the Crusade for Justice. More about that will be covered in our session on the Chicano movement. And on December 9th, the Denver police raided the Black Panther headquarters and this was also the same day as Lauren Watson's wedding. Um, what's important to understand is that this type of targeted um, raids were happening from police all across the country in many different local chapters. Um, and the damages that were done were extremely significant. And there's more that can be um, learned about that too from some archives that exist at Colorado History, or History Colorado. Um, in 1970, Lauren Watson was put on legal trial, and his trial was actually made into a three-part documentary series. Um, this was, again, part of a strategy to really encourage the public um, to be against leaders um, that were aligned with Black liberation and Black power. Um, and so this is just another example of that, although it was broadcast in a way saying that it was an examination of the US judicial system. On September 5th, um, the Denver Black Panther chapter was dissolved by the National Committee, as I already mentioned, and replaced with the National Committee to combat fascism. So with all of this, what can we learn? What were some of the strategies and actions that we can take away from the really meaningful power building of the Black Panthers? First of all, know your rights. We can learn what our rights are, not just federally, but also locally, and know how to assert them in an effective way. One of the strategies that they used was actually a cop watch because their communities were so surveilled and heavily um, targeted with police brutality. Their strategy was then, okay, well, we're gonna watch you right back because there was no other means of accountability. Um, and this is something that they learned from the Watts community in LA and then replicated in Oakland and many other chapters did as well. They rallied around people who were directly impacted by the issues that they cared the most about, um, like Denzel Dowell, right? They formed 10 central demands and beliefs, and they required for all members to memorize this uh, platform, and not just to like recite it, but also to exercise it and how they took action. They used media by making strategic press messages and creating their own newspapers to share information. And many of those newspapers are actually archived at Blair Caldwell here in Denver. And the National Committee and local chapters, they created their own infrastructure to be able to sustain the rapid growth of their organization. And also to have contributing roles of what the National Committee did and what local chapters did and the autonomy that could go back and forth. There were direct services to meet the needs of black community at the time. And there were strategic alliances with organizations who were aligned with their agenda, like SNCC, like other um, organizations um, that again, you can learn a lot more about in the papers that are available. But I have been talking for a really long time. 
And now we're gonna move to our panel so we can hear from some of our experts. So um, today here we have with us Hisira Sol Ashamu, who is a living legacy from a bloodline of healers and community organizers, including Lauren Watson, who is the founder of the Denver Black Panther Party chapter. Hisira Sol envisioned the movement to heal a people, also the title of his long anticipated book, based on his time traveling the world and raising his family in Ghana as a way for people to connect with people of culture, wisdom, practices, and spirituality. He inspires transformation from the inside out by reintroducing people of culture to the success sciences and human potential practices, making manifesting change and healing mind, body, and soul more accessible to the wider range of the world's population. He has engaged with thousands of people through keynote speaking, executive and community coaching, and facilitating learning journeys at the individual, community, national, and international levels. He has worked with hundreds of nonprofits, corporations, governmental agencies, and public institutions across the U.S. and five African nations. In his book, To Heal a, Pe to Heal a People, he shared his personal experiences and what he has learned with others interested in a lifetime of personal liberation. Um, with that, let's welcome Hasira to come to the front. Our next panelist that we have is Jamika Lewis, who is the senior librarian at the Blair Caldwell African American Research Library here in Denver. She has been a featured speaker for organizations such as the Denver Center for Performing Arts, the University of Colorado Boulder, the Denver Press Club, and Denver Pop Culture Con. She conducts presentations, research, and training in the areas of equity, diversity, inclusion. She recently worked as a freelance researcher on a project titled For the Record, examining how the golden transcript contributed to systemic racism, which was inspired by her research into media bias against the Black Panther Party. Let's welcome Jamika. We were um, going to be joined as well today by Dr. Rachel Harding, um, but unfortunately she's not able to make it. Um, but I would still like to share a little bit about her and encourage you all to please connect with her work. Dr. Rachel Harding is the daughter of Rosemary Freeney and Dr. Vincent Harding. She is a writer, historian, and poet. She is a specialist in religions of Afro-Atlantic diaspora studies and the relationship between religion, creativity, and social justice activism and cross-cultural perspective. Dr. Harding co-directs the Veterans of Hope Project, a community initiative on religion, creativity, and inclusive democracy. She's also an associate professor of indigenous spiritual traditions at the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, again, she wasn't able to make it today and sends her regards, um, but I highly encourage you to learn from her work where she archives also a lot of wisdom from her mother, Rosemary Freeney, and her father, Dr. Vincent Harding, who is a very beloved community member here in Denver. And with that, let's get into some questions that we have for our panel. I'm like, let me move around. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Thank you again for being here. Um, Hisira, I have my first question is for you. From your lived experience, what do you hope that people learn from the Black Panther Party? and from the legacy of your father, Lauren Watson. First of all, thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, if I were going to um, articulate it in, in the now is that it's important to understand that all of the forces that existed in the time that my father was active are just as active 
and if not more so nuanced than in his day. So um, understanding what happened then is really a study of what's going on now. It's not like this historical backward gazing at, at history in, in that sense. And so from that perspective, uh, understanding Hoover, um, I don't, I, you said President Hoover, but it was, Hoover was the head of the FBI. Mm -hmm. um, who is that person today? Right, and what role does it play? I, I remember at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement about four years ago, there was this particular designation that the FBI made of Black, Ma Black Lives Matter activists that because they designated them in that particular way, it set them up for all type of um, uh, prosecution, all kinds of, right? And so that's now. Right, so I think it's really important to ask ourselves what are we doing right now in the present to engage these fascist forces that um, in many ways have galvanized and strengthened themselves far beyond what my father was dealing with in, in, in the late 60s, early 70s. And so the question uh, which was a very popular question back then, is what we're going to do now, right? So, yeah, understanding the history is important, understanding that it's as important now uh, as far as organization is concerned, as far as um, how we taking care of ourselves and how we relate with each other is concerned. Uh, I went to go see a movie about five days ago called Lakota. I don't know if anybody's seen that documentary. Have people seen this documentary? Go see it. It's dope. Um, but they talk about the Black Hills and the movement that was, exists with AIM inside of the Black Hills in North Dakota and South Dakota and how um, what comes very prevalent in that documentary is the relationship, which I, it, I, I will land on, on the point. The relationship between AIM and the Black Panther Party, the relationship between those organizations during that day that were really, really cohesive uh, and open and worked with each other very, very clearly, probably personified in no better person than um, Fred Hampton in Chicago and what he was able to do um, with the Appalachians, what he was able to do with the Chicano movement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I, the question really stands now, what are we going to do? What are we doing in the face of these type of forces? How are we taking care of each other? How are we communicating with each other? What are we using these type of forums for? Uh, making sure that they just don't turn into navel gazing exercises where we're we're gazing back into the history of the Black Panthers and uh, not understanding the present moment that we're in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I can really like you're bringing me back. I'm like time traveling a bit in my mind to like 2014 when I was like really cutting my teeth, if you will, like here in Denver and and movement work and just seeing. Again, the increased militarization, um, even just here in, with our Denver police, right? There was a whole gang unit um, with like war kind of military um, gear that they would bring to a very simple march, right? Um, when we would rally around um, young people like um, Ryan Ronquillo or um, Jesse, you know, for being murdered and many others that continue to be so. Um, I feel like this is a great segue into one of the questions I have for Jamaica. Um, as you engage with the Black Panther, with Black Panther archives and other like Black History archives, um, what are the stories that you notice go untold and that you wish were more amplified? So first, thank you for having me. Um, I had to take notes on that question because there's so many. Um, my philosophy as a historian and as someone who has the privilege of protecting these stories and presenting them in the way that they were meant to be presented um, 
there's far too many untold stories. So I, I did take some notes. So um, it's definitely the role of women in black liberation movements and in the party. Um, a lot of times when we talk about the Black Panthers, you do see um, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale as the face. Uh, here in Denver, you definitely saw Lauren Watson. So blessings to you. It's an honor to sit on this panel with you. Um, but you don't see people talk about um, Catherine Cleaver. You don't see you know people talking about Angela Davis. You don't see people talking about these incredible women who um, at, at a certain point in the history of the Panthers, the number of women outnumbered the number of male members. And so most people don't know that. And the Black Panther Party was one of the first black liberation movements that really elevated women to leadership roles and very visible roles. Um, so that's one story that is, is, is horrifically untold. And of course it's on purpose. Um, when it comes to black liberation, there's moments when we want women to be at the head, but it's when the hate and the vitriol has already gotten high. And so it's expected for black women to start taking more of that abuse um, once it's gotten to that point. With the Panthers though, women were always considered um, from the get go. I actually spoke with someone, I won't reveal who the source is, but I spoke with someone who was in the room with Huey Newton and Bobby Seale when they were developing the 10 point plan. And it happened at a woman's house. Mm -hmm. And this source was a woman. Mm -hmm. And she told me the excitement in their faces and in their eyes. And she told me about the fear that they had because they knew they were starting something that was gonna be very impactful. Um, and so the fact that even from the very moment that they decided to organize this, this was done at a woman's home. Um, so that's very much so an untold story. Um, another untold story is how many of Black Panther Party members were killed and assassinated. Um, one of the things that, as a historian, makes it really hard for me to continually look through um, these newspapers is in nearly every single issue, they're highlighting the story of another Panther who was murdered. Um, and we talk about some of the more well-known ones, but the fact that this was happening in so many different chapters, even with um, folks who weren't even necessarily considered full members, with folks who were former members, with their family members, I mean, they were terrorized in so many different ways and brutally murdered. Um, their stories are told in these newspapers. Um, also, I like that you mentioned Liberation School um, that you know was here in Denver. When I, whenever I go out and I talk about the Black Panthers and especially the Denver chapter, um, people don't know that nationally, between national programs and local programs, the Panthers started over 60 individual initiatives and programs specifically to help the black community. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was free breakfast, yes, which did inspire um, the federal program. Um, it, there wasn't a direct link. I, I, as a historian, I have to be accurate. There isn't that direct link, but it was inspired by. Um, but we don't know about things like they had clothing and specifically shoe drives for black boys because um, it was hard to find shoes and clothing that black boys actually wanted to wear. Um, they didn't talk about ambulance rides. They were providing, like the Panthers were sponsoring and paying for a free ambulance rides. Um, we know even now how, how that could, an ambulance ride can be $4,000, $5,000. And imagine you know, how much that was back then, that could devastate a family. And so the Panthers used that $100,000 a month that was coming in. Um, they were very targeted with that money and they were very intentional with what they were doing with it. And that money did go to support a lot of programs that benefited everyday black people. Um, one of the things that we like to talk about the civil rights movement is how folks at all different you know, socioeconomic and social levels were involved. But if we're real, when, it talk, when we talk about leaders of these uh, movements, we always talk about quote unquote black elites. What the, made the Panthers different was that yes, Huey and Bobby Seale were educated men. Huey had a PhD. Um, I mean, they were educated men, but 
one of the uh, the things I think that made the Black Panthers different from other liberation movements is that they appeal to everyone of all socioeconomic statuses, um, and they put their money where their mouth was. Um, and then one more thing was the fact that, well, two, quickly. The Panthers were very involved in international affairs mm -hmm. and, and they stayed very well informed on what was going on internationally. Um, a lot of Panther leaders were exiled in different countries like Switzerland and they weren't just sitting around in exile. They were strategizing mm -hmm. while they were there. They were helping out local efforts um, for freedom and liberation and that's something we just don't talk about a lot. Um, and then lastly, we do talk about the 10 point plan. A lot of people, you you know, mentioned the 10 point plan for the party. What isn't often mentioned is that there were membership requirements to join the Panthers. Um, you could not be a drug user. You could not be a marijuana user. If you were found to be using marijuana, you were immediately expelled from um, being a member of the Panthers. You also could not be in active military. And of course, in the 10 point plan, they adamantly opposed um, black men serving in the military, but you could not be an active military person, um, service member and be in the Black Panther Party. Um, you had to wait until your military service was done and you even had a waiting period after that until you could be considered for membership. So um, they were very strategic and very clear about who they wanted as members because they understood that this was huge and this was gonna be huge and they were trying to lessen the um, maybe ability or lessen the possibility of someone infiltrating even though we know that that it eventually happened. But these rules and regulations they had were very specific and they were very strategic and they were very, very powerful. Um, they all, it all had a reason and all had a purpose. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I feel like um, that was one of my struggles in research with the first point that you made. It was like really being able to amplify the stories of women who were involved. Um, even in many of the other social movements that are covered in the research paper that I put forward, there's all there's kind of like almost this archetype that the women were in service of men. However, in um, some of the sources that I, I had for particularly the Black Panthers, there was like an acknowledgement of the struggle of combating the system of patriarchy, right? Um, the power and privileges that men have in our society and that constantly brushing up against each other and this wrestling of like, well, these are powerful women and they're leading many important things in our like local chapters in this national space and how that was constantly recognized or dismissed. Like there was a lot of conversations and I really think that um, um, in Hillard's uh, but autobiography, he, he expresses that in a really unique and um, interesting way. Um, and the other thing I was gonna mention was al along the lines of services, if you look in uh, the report again, um, there's actually a really comprehensive list, not naming all you know 60 plus um, initiatives that were happening, but um, if people needed support, because they were facing eviction, there was rent assistance types of programs. If people were, um, you know, just needing a lawyer because they were fighting an unjust court case, like there's just so many things like have a need, and there was there was it met with with so much trust, and that's part of what I mean is like how much trust was able to be garnered. But um, yeah, there's there's only so much to to say in a timeline, which is why we hope that this conversation can continue to inspire you to dive deeper, you know, because like Hasira said, this is the now. These are the same issues that our communities are facing now. Um, I think, okay, Jamaica, I have another question for you. Um, from your archival work, what trends have you found in media biases against the Panthers? And how do you see those messages surfacing again in our current times, especially when it comes to Black Lives Matter? I love this question so much. Um, so backing up a little bit, um, the Golden Transcript Newspaper Project that I that I'm, you, were men you mentioned in my bio, 
Um, I'll, I'll back up a little bit as to how that even came about. So at Blair Caldwell, we received these Black Panther Party newspapers and we had like six to start. And I was like, mm, no, we need like 90. So um, I had a fantastic colleague who worked to get us more and we have more and we're gonna be getting more and gonna be getting more. So as I'm combing through these, I'm like, we really need to highlight the fact that we have these in our archives. Um, and so I did a whole media tour for about six months straight um, for local media, just asking what the significance was, what does all this mean, so on and so forth. So I was invited to speak about them at the Denver Press Club. Um, while I was there, part of my presentation, um, my presentation was focused on the Black, the Black Pregnant Party Communal News Service, which was is the name of the newspaper. Um, it, that was one of the primary and largest um, sources of income for the Panthers was the sale of that newspaper. And so once it exploded to going national, that definitely increased, um, that was behind increasing that $100,000 a month um, income. And so during my presentation, I talked about how um, Denver's white media treated the Black Panther parties and the Black Panther Party with definitely specific leaders. They mentioned Lauren Watson ad nauseum, calling this man a thug, a criminal, um, a blight on society, um, a, an, an interrupter, a racist, I mean, all this stuff. So I actually, since I don't, I, I'm gonna go away from being proper. I ain't never scared to talk about like the real. So I pulled clips from white media in different Denver newspapers and I had them all up on the screen like this and was like, here's what y'all's media was saying mm -hmm. about Black Panthers. And mind you, this is the Denver Press Club, okay? Guess who's in there? White media is in there, okay? So yes, so it just so happened that I talked about the Golden Transcript, um, which was a newspaper, is a newspaper, it's still around, um, that focused on the Golden community. But this Golden Transcript newspaper, between the years of like 1968 to 1970, 71, published almost 200 articles on the Black Panthers. And it's like, Golden is a community of like what, 1%? not even 1% of black people, why are you publishing 200 articles about this organization? So I called them out. I was like, go to Transcript. Y'all got some explaining to do. I want to know. The people want to know why. And, and most of it wasn't stuff that was published or written by local reporters. It was stuff reproduced from API, UPI, stuff like that. So that makes it worse. It's like you, all of this stuff that's coming through these wire services and this is what you choose, right? And not to mention, there's other newspapers that are publishing stuff about the Panthers, but you're not talking about that. They weren't talking about the stuff from the, the newspaper Lauren Watson worked for that was covering what the Panthers are doing. So um, it just so happened <laughs> that one of the audience members um, was Linda Shapley, who is the head of Colorado Community Media. And guess who is under Colorado Community Media? The Golden Transcript. <laughs> so she pulled me to the side and was like, that's my newspaper, let's chat. So eventually, long story short, um, she wrote a grant and we received a grant to dive deeper into the Golden Transcript's biased coverage of the Black Panther Party. I served as lead researcher on that project, and even before I sat down with the reporters, um, they had to undergo EDI training. I am not about to, ooh, I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> I'm not about to allow white reporters to tell the story of media bias against the Black Panthers without understanding their own biases. Okay, yeah. so they had, before I would even sit down and chat with them, um, they had to undergo equity training mm -hmm. to spot um, media bias. So we worked on that project. It was a few months. Um, my part in it was to pull um, these articles from different sources. And I pulled all the articles from the Golden Transcript. Um, and they were horrific. Um, oh, I should have brought my phone. I would have read some highlights, but just the language was horrifying. Um, articles from the Post. The Post, they, you don't get to escape because y'all were trifling too. Um, 
And just looking at, at the difference, so yes, I pulled um, articles from white-led media, but I also delved, dive deeper in the archives and pulled articles from black-led media. And when you put those articles next to each other, covering the exact same event, it was glaring. Yeah. And when you put those articles, when you put those two together, and then you fast forward to 2018, 2019, and you put articles from black-led media about Black Lives Matter and white-led media, what do you think you see? The same. So long story short, what did I learn? Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. That's what I've learned. The only thing that has changed is that the language has become more quote unquote sophisticated. So some of these white led media, they won't say thugs, they won't say criminals, they will say disruptors or rioters or demonstrators, even at peaceful events. Take disruptor and rioter and replace it with thug and criminal and that's the only difference between the media from the 60s and the media from now. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. Um, I mean, it's so important because I think that's something that we underestimate, right? It's like, it's not just like, at least in the articulation of the research that I'm sharing with you all, that there was a white man who wanted to affirm himself that was Solinsky as the one who knows how to community organize and build power. This is something that was so widespread and so highly encouraged, which is why so many of these stories are so repressed, that it's so hard to access, right? That we even have to build like and rebuild so many archives. Um, yeah, and I feel like it speaks a lot to, you know, what Hazir was saying and in his initial response. And so, um, yeah. I'm just like sitting here, like really digesting like so much of that. And your work is making huge impacts. I recently met with um, uh, a colleague who was a former journalist and who was talking about the Golden Triangle and how they actually publicly have redacted many of the articles that they put forward of the Black Panthers. And they were so curious. They're like, I wonder what that was about. And now I can let them know, like, oh, Jamika Lewis was like behind that. Um, you know what I mean? So that's amazing. Um, and so I think that's the other aspect. It's like we should never underestimate our power of influence that we can have in whatever we do in community um, and, and how this history applies to us right now. Um, is here, I have another question for you, and then we're gonna open it up to our audience here, um, as well as folks online, as long as we have some time. Um, <laughs> but um, I know, especially in your book, and in a lot of the work that you do now, it's so centered on healing. And, um, and I found, like listening to some of uh, the things available online about your book and the work you're doing, uh, I felt like so much connection around that centering of joy and I'm curious, like, how do you see this history as interconnected with our healing and how we tap into greater joy? I think people can hear me. I, we need it for the, oh, okay, for the yeah. people online. I was just about to leave y'all all out of it <laughs> since y'all didn't come here. They're around the state. Yeah, yeah, they're around. We get it. We get it. Membership has its privileges, though. Um, yeah, so I think what's important to understand is that this has all been an exercise for the past 500 years in joy, right? Like joy is, and it's been an exercise in healing. And let me explain what I mean by that. <clears throat> um, the reason why racism exists in the world today as it exists and as it has existed for the past 300 years is because a certain particular group of white bodied individuals in Europe were highly traumatized. And in them being traumatized in Europe, they then exported that trauma 
to the United States and the indigenous people of this land and then went to Africa and exported the trauma there and made the big bowl of trauma that we're going, we got going on now. That part of the story is not articulated or understood because either, this is what generally happens. White people will become villainized. They will either repel from that accusation in history or um, completely blank it out because it's traumatic and it doesn't get addressed. You had uh, Dr. Joy DeGruy's book there, Post Traumatic Slave S Syndrome, right? <clears throat> That's a history for white-bodied individuals as well. So the, I asked the question, if white folks was treating people of color that way, what the hell happened to white folks? We don't talk about that. We become pathologized. We talk about the healing that's necessary in, in, in black-bodied uh, Afro-Indigenous people. We don't ever get to the conversation that says this is, was a sick people. And I don't mean sick as in just, you know, ew. I mean, we have to look at how do we, how do we heal the wounds of racism that caused this, what in, in Afro-Indigenous terms, we call the great ma'afa, the last 500 years, right? And so when, when I look to address this question, I don't do so from a shame or blame perspective. I have no interest in shaming white people for their history, right? None of whatsoever. I have never seen in my work how shaming people creates a difference in behavior. And if the outcome, if the ultimate outcome is a shift in behavior, then what is the value of shaming? Right, um, And so when we talk about it being a healing exercise, we address it from the perspective of that we are in all, in, I, I love that the, uh, the uh, indigenous saying, um, right, where, where they talk about relations, right? Relations to the rocks, relations to the wind, relations like we, this is, we're all in relationship. They say relation, right? I am, that's such a deep, heavy saying when you really begin to articulate it because then it, 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 it levels the playing field that we're all family and what are we going to do in order to eradicate the illnesses that we are addressed with right now? And the wounds of racism, right? The, the, the deep scarring, we can't talk about, you know, I, I, I've gone into epigenetics and studying how that, you know, wounding gets, you know, pushed forward. Um, and this is just not a conversation that's popularized in media. Even right now, what are we articulating? We are talking about what happened in Alabama and Black people, if we're keeping a score, like that's one we won, right? And now you can go on social media and you see we're holding chairs and you know, there's all kind of, you know, but it's such a, it's such a very, it, from a sociological perspective, it's such a very interesting to understand that why would we emotionally even view that as a win? Like, how wounded are we that that becomes a win for us? Such a small moment in time, and I'm not saying that anybody did anything wrong. That's not what I'm trying to articulate. What I'm saying is that if that's on T-shirts now, it's you know they don't make rap songs about it. It's on you know it's a thing, yeah. right? It's a thing. I am suspect over why it's a thing. Why such like who is pushing that narrative of black people against white people as we get ready to run up to elections, as we get ready to engage in uh, articulations of civil rights and what's, for me it's, it's, it's bullshit, right? And so I, I warn Afro-Indigenous people in particular 
behind getting caught up in trends of that. And people say, well, you know, we showed unity. Yeah, we did in crisis, but we've never had a problem showing unity in crisis. It's when we're out of crisis that the unity issue comes into play. And that is a, if you study healing, that's a pattern, right? If you only love your, your partner, if they cussing you out or you in some type of fighting stance with your partner, you know, people are in relationships like that. We have an unhealthy relationship with each other and it's, 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 uh, it's pushed that way. So, um, To come back to your, your question as far as healing is concerned, this is why we are, we see the work. There's a book by Ayikwe Arma, a famous Ghanaian writer um, called The Healers. He's also wrote 2,000 Seasons and The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. If you haven't read any of those books, absolutely go and get those, those three books. 2,000 Seasons. The beautiful ones are not yet born, and the healers. And he talks about how it's necessary for us to heal a people. And that's how I came up with the, right? Like fundamentally, we can talk about economics, and this is why I love that you did Dr. Joyce DeGruppa, because she's saying the same thing. You can talk about economics, you can talk about political solidarity, you can talk about all of that, but if people haven't healed the, their fundamental humanness, then all of that is just, right? Yeah, it's for what? It's fluff, right? Because people are going home wounded. People are dealing with their, ch I was inside of the Denver public school system, sweet Jesus, and what children are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, even today, my both, I have two daughters at East High School. There were seven shootings at East High School last year. Seven, four murders. East High School is the pinnacle of public education in Colorado. There's no school more popular. The mayor's children have gone there. Governor's children, industry leaders go to East High School. I went to East High School. And you have seven shootings and four murders and my children are filming it from the third floor choir room as if they're just watching social, you know, like it's a, and this is, this is this is the environment. This is Colorado. This is Denver. I mean, this is not Chicago or L.A. or but this is where we are right now. So how are we going to heal that? What are we doing to heal that? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. I just it brings me to like why um, you know racial equity work is at the center of so much of what I do, which I really see this research project as an extension of that effort. And my whole like commitment to that is because I'm interested and committed in restoring our humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like we are so dehumanized from these systems that we can't yeah. see and hear each other. Yeah. Can I, add right? mm -hmm. I wanna add this point. One of the problems or challenges that we have when we're looking at the Black Panther Party, we don't articulate white involvement in it. You don't understand, you didn't see, if you are a white bodied individual, you didn't see yourself articulated in just what just took place there. That's purposeful and not by you, but by and large, you are made to seem outside of the conversation of what happens for Afro-Indigenous liberation in this country. And the truth of the matter is, is that no liberation, Afro-Indigenous liberation in this country could have ever taken place on any successful demonstrable scale without white body participation. Not one movement that we're talking about, whether we're talking about the Niagara movement, or we're talking about the civil rights movement, whether we're talking about the Underground Railroad that was funded and supported by white bodied individuals, whether we're talking about the Black Panther movement that was supported by Jane Fonda's family, but it was supported by um, uh, Marlon Brando and many of these white bodied Hollywood figures funded the Black Panther Party. But when you go to the movies, what you see is a bunch of angry black men wearing leather and you don't see your participation in how you have supported and how during the, 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 the slavery movements that white people had, they had armies, militias. 
I'm not talking about just a placard in the middle of Colfax, like Black Lives Matter. No, I'm talking about guns, bullets, what y'all want. We're going to give you the smoke if you keep enslaving Afro-Indigenous people. But you don't see yourselves and you're not taught to see yourselves in the liberation. But you have a history inside of liberation, human liberation movements. And if you don't know that, then this sounds like it's just black history or Afro-Indigenous history, and it's important. Don't get me wrong, Afro-Indigenous people need to know that we have a particular autonomy, that people are not always doing things for us. That's not the point that I'm making. There's a reason why Huey Newton's the most popular Black Panther that was had, and not an Elaine Brown who ran that organization for three years while he was in prison. Right? There's a reason why that is. There's a reason why they don't talk about the Black Panther Party specifically in Chicago that had Appalachian white poor. The, when you talk about poor white people, it doesn't get poorer than Appalachian white folks. Them aligned with the uh, Latinos inside of Chicago, the alliances that were formed. There's a reason why you don't, when you go to the movies in Hollywood, you don't see that. So what I'm saying with that is that we cannot afford, white-bodied individuals cannot afford to think that liberation of humanity inside of the United States is merely and only a BIPOC endeavor. You have a history there. It's your responsibility to learn it. Then it's your responsibility to pick up the baton where your ancestors left off for the liberation of all people. A whole word, you know? I mean, do you have any questions? Do you have any more questions? <laughs> I did. I did buy an Alabama t-shirt. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> OK. I, I bought the earrings too. It says, it says fade in the water. It's great. I'm sorry. Because I'm going to be out there. I'm just going to be out there. Um, but so my apologies. This has been um, so overwhelming and fulfilling. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to talk about your time in Ghana. Um, I spent my undergrad summer in Ghana. And if I could go back and live without the malaria issue, I would go. Um, what, what caused you, what, what was your reasoning to take that, that time to go back? Um, what was your experience like? How long did you stay? And would you do it again? <laughs> so, um, thank you for that. And again, I'm not throwing shade towards I, my point about Alabama is that we celebrate things when we don't when we have very little else to celebrate, right? So we celebrate the least common denominator, right? Um, but no shade uh, with that. I do understand, right? Um, so yes, I moved to. Ghana in January 27th, 2001, because George Bush was elected president here. I lived in Colorado. I had a child. Uh, we had children, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. There, I, I don't know how many people follow my age group here. Probably not many, but I do see a, a few people. I'm giving you a nod, but I'm not saying, I'm not, I won't look towards you, so I won't, you know. Um, but there were some very key elements inside of the American society that I felt like it was a good time to, to shift. The first one was John Benet Ramsey's um, event was, had taken over Colorado at that point. I had two small children. If a small, blonde, white, bouldered girl was not safe, then my three-year-old daughter, my one-year-old son, I didn't have confidence that I could protect them. And that brings me to the second event that happened, which was Columbine. So Colorado seemed like a very precarious place in particular, but the United States seemed like a very pre uh, precarious place in general to be around. And of course, eight months after I moved there, 9-11 happened. 
um, got on what I, I often articulated as a beautiful struggle. It was beautiful in the sense that um, my children were allowed to be free. They experienced true freedom. I could let my children leave out of the home at seven o'clock in the morning and not see them all day long. And I didn't have anything to worry about them. With that being said, there was also major challenges around being surrounded by that level of poverty um, for extended periods of time. I was there for 10 years. Um, being around that level of Americans really don't understand poverty. We just don't understand it. It's, you know, when it was not until I moved to Ghana and I understood this, the statements of first world, third world, you really feel like you're on a different planet because you cannot fathom human beings living in that type of squalor on a planet that also has this type of opulence and, and, and resources available to it. Um, so that was, the, that was a, a, another major takeaway um, from, from Ghana. Uh, the reason why I moved back is because they discovered oil in Ghana. Well, they did two things. They made Ghana the head of AFROCOM, which is the military wing of the United States abroad is in Ghana. They built a what they call a third level embassy, which means it's it's the biggest embassy that that they have. Like they put up three models, A, B, or C. C is like the big. That means they plan on staying a while, right? Um, and so when they built that, they built it because they discovered oil in Ghana. If you've studied African or Afro-Indigenous history or the planet wide, whenever resources are discovered in third world countries, it does not bode well for the people on the ground. And so I had lived there throughout the 10 year Sierra Leone Liberian War, uh, which means we commonly saw, and when I say commonly, I mean daily saw individuals with only one arm because that's that was what happened in the Sierra Leone Liberian War because they was digging for diamonds, they would chop off the the arms. So we saw hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of one people with one arms um, who were the refugee camps were there. Um, we didn't, we weren't sure that that wasn't going to reoccur in Ghana once the resources were found, and then they discovered oil. The oil fields were were developed. Then they built a highway to the tankers to the ocean, and they called the name of that highway the George W. Bush Highway. So when that happened, I felt like sweet Jesus was talking to me, saying it might be time to shift, right, with the, the elements that were taking place. And that's when we moved back here and got involved in, in all of the events that, that were here. Other questions? Uh, here and then there. Um, thank you to all three of you. This has been an incredibly educational um, conversation so far. And um, I've had the opportunity to be raised overseas uh, in American and international schools. And it fascinated me a couple of points that you brought up, one being that uh, Black Panthers in exile in other countries learned so much and became involved in local overseas, right? But also your point of, you need to understand what's happening now and not just stay in history. But, but I, I, I guess my question is, I, I don't quite understand how to understand history and not just what happens, but mental trauma and heal. Like how, how do you heal in a country that what, what I've seen, I don't have children, but I, I remember being in Michigan and uh, an elective, elective, I can elect to take world history. How do we in the United States heal if we can't even understand where we're coming from, if we don't, I mean, I'm, so, so I'm kind of grappling with that. How, how do we understand them now if, if uh, yeah, yeah, so anyway, just, uh, my question is in there, I hope it's understood. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, well, I think we have to embrace the truth of what's happened so we can see what is happening, you know? Everyone can answer I, question. Yeah, <laughs> I think we have to accept that healing is a personal responsibility. Um, our government is not gonna do anything for us that is going to allow us to heal, okay? We could get all the reparations that we are due, which we are due, um, we will not heal from receiving reparations. Um, healing is personal. And at the same time, healing is also communal, okay? In order for us to heal, I think, number one, you have to acknowledge where the harm came from. You have to acknowledge the harm happened. Um, you don't necessarily have to own the harm. You do have to acknowledge it and name it. I'm a very strong proponent of naming things because when you name something, you take ownership of it and then you are the one who can be the catalyst to change it. Um, I think we have to realize that a lot of this trauma is not just um, situational, it is in our DNA. Um, and we pass that down when we choose to not confront um, what has happened. Um, it's hard. It's very hard. It's hard as a historian to talk about how many people who fight for black liberation are killed, who have been murdered, who have been slaughtered. How do I, as a historian, not absorb that? I go home. After this, I'm going to go home, shower, and wash all of this off, because it is traumatizing to talk about and to educate people about. I'm going to wrap up in a blanket, and I'm going to game until it's time for me to go to bed. That's what helps me heal. Okay, I think we have to understand healing is an individual responsibility and it's gonna look different for everyone. What brings healing? I think the biggest catalyst for healing is joy. Finding what makes you joyful and not what everyone says should make you joyful. I'm not the bubble bath, self-care, bath bomb person. I'm going to shower uh, with a loofah though. Um, and I'm going to game and that will heal me from this, that will heal me from all the other stuff that's happening, but it won't happen all at once either. Healing is not linear and it's continual and it will last the rest of our lives and it will last the rest of human existence. Mm -hmm. Great answer, great answer. Um, what's your name again, sister? Gigi. Gigi, what, what's your, your heritage? Got you. Everything is mixed up. I feel you. I feel you. Got some of that going on myself. Yeah, collab, human collaboration. So here's the thing about that, that question, is that I have studied with medicine men in Africa. I have studied with medicine men in Central America. I spent a lot of time in Costa Rica. Uh, my favorite country in the world, by the way, for lots of reasons. We could talk about that offline. With that said, there is no group of healers, indig Afro-Indigenous healers that I've ever come across that have not in some way, shape, or form understood that what we're going through was supposed to be what we're going through. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, we as Afro-Indigenous people map the stars with the naked eye, by the way, the Dogon people. We, uh, they found pyramids in South America, Central America, mm -hmm. very intelligent people. We understood this had to happen. We understand that that history is not some unscientific reality that we're experiencing. And, and so what I'm trying to articulate to you, sis, is that many of us, unless we understand that this is a marathon, can become overwhelmed with the certain circumstances that we find ourselves, right? It can feel overwhelming. And we, it, we can, it can become heavy. And so the only way that, you, that if, 
that that's only if you understand history from a Western linear perspective. If you understand what's taking place on the planet now from a Afro-Indigenous, non-Westernized perspective, this is a blink in the eye of what we're talking about as far as who we are as beings. And why would we have given ourselves this last 500 years? 500 years is such a small, even in human history, it's a very small period of time. White folks have only been calling themselves white folks for like 200 years. Yeah. You would think that this is, like before the 200 years, if I came in here calling people white people, y'all would be looking around like, who the hell is he talking about? Who are these white people you speak of? Now you can't even imagine yourself being anything but white if you haven't taken the time to reflect on who you actually are as Germans, as Jews, as Irish, as these ethnicities that you existed before you were stripped of it, again, trauma, and made to become white, trauma again. So what I'm saying is that if you tell me, Gigi, what is going on with you in your life right now? If you just focused on relationships with yourself, with your children, with a partner, that's a whole lifetime of work right there. If you're an Afro-Indigenous person, you have relationships completely stripped away from you. The way that you talk, your mama talked to you is a direct result of what happened on the plantation directly. That's what Dr. Joyce Degree is talking about. She gives an example of a mother that cannot give her son credit and speak to him and speak power into him. How many people watch the boxing match? The one that just took place, of course, we're on that. Thank you, bro. The one, I, I feel you, man, for holding it down. The dude that won, his name is Crawford, right? Just, to, just so that you could follow what I'm saying around healing. They interviewed Crawford's mother. Did you see the interview with his mama? Did you see the interview with his mama? This boy, she made him fight. She said that she would give any boy in the neighborhood $100 if they whooped her son. So he was getting his ass whooped all the time. He was a target. And he said that if he felt like if he could win, then his mother would tell him that she loved him. And to this day, she has never told this boy that she loves him. That's why he's a world champion right now. Do you understand what kind of couch work that young boy needs right now? The reason why he's a champion in the Western tradition is because he was totally abused and traumatized as a child into his adulthood. That it, This is the world champion that is on ESPN right now that we're glorifying and he has suffered that type of abuse where his mama still says she can't tell him that she loves him. Dr. Degree talks about that on the plant. That's a plantation behavior, by the way, y'all. That, that type of behavior comes directly from the plantation where a mother, because if she showed love towards her child, he was, he, he's, he's gone. Yeah. Yeah. We weren't allowed to form healthy attachments. So I'm saying to you, what does it look like in your own personal trajectory to be in relationship with yourself and other human beings. I guarantee you, if you're a person of color, even if you're white uh, body identified, there's some trauma there. So I see it as our goal is to <clears throat> heal three generations back. So that means I gotta heal my mama, my mama mama, and my mama mama mama. There's a much, Easier way to have said that. I could have said great grandparent. <laughs> but I got to make it clear to you, I'm speaking Ebonics on this stage right now. <laughs> I have enough healing to do just through, a, I have three biological children, six babies I picked up along the way. If I didn't do anything but focus on the relationships that I have with my children, I'm healing my mother 
who was born in a New York state prison, who was given up for adoption at the age of three. I'm healing three generations back and I'm gonna heal three generations forward. What else do you have to focus on? You, many people wanna go out in the world and Black Lives Matter and heal everything in the world and you follow those same people home and it's a hot ass damn mess when you get to their house. My uncle once said, if every white person on this planet disappeared tomorrow, we would be dealing with white supremacy, racism inside of our own being for the next 200 years, just as far as the trauma that we've dealt with. Right? This is also true for white bodied individuals. Y'all in a hot ass, y'all just need to go take a break for a moment and really reflect on how did you become white? That was not an easy process. Y'all don't get to talk about that. Y'all don't get to talk about what it meant to become, to start off Irish and end up a white person. White Irish people were treated like dogs here in America, Italians too, Jewish people. So what is that wounding? What is, how do you treat your child now because of that process? Oh yeah, we got a whole healing, heaping hot ass mess to deal with, but it's, it's what we're here to do. That's why we're here. We're not here to get jobs. We're here to heal that so that we can project forward in my judgment. Absolutely, right? Because again, this is intergenerational work. I know there's a question there and then I wanna check. There's no one online. Okay, cool. Um, well, there are people online. Sorry, just no questions Maybe. right now online. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, how do we see ourselves as a part? And I think also too what Hasira said about if, even if all white people were gone, we'd still have white supremacy because this is something I tell um, my gente a lot, Latino people a lot, is that we don't need a colonizer anymore to tell us what to do, because it's right here in our mind and in our veins. And that's part of our ancestry. Also, a uh, shameless plug, if you are a white person and you want to dig into some of this, there's an offering that I'm part of. Check, check. Showing up for Racial Justice Denver, um, and it's a 10-week program on confronting white supremacy and starting to ask those questions for yourself. So um, something to consider. If you want to know more about that, we can talk after, too. So first, thank you guys so much. This was incredible, and thank you for hosting. Thank you to Regis. Um, you guys got me thinking of so many different things. And when you're talking about galvanized trauma being in the blood and healing three generations back and three generations forward, that's so important. Um, I'm an educator, um, social studies teacher in a middle school. And I guess my question is, because this is based off of when I saw the Little Rock Nine, I saw this speech uh, Minnie Jean Brown gave. Um, and she was saying that we deny children the truth when we deny them the complexity of history. And so my question is how as an educator do I responsibly work toward teaching these children how to address their own trauma, their family's trauma? Because um, that, that really drives my work is that complexity of history and to not deny them the truth while also being responsible towards their age, their family's values, and like, is there an entry point? <laughs> Y'all got simple questions. <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> yeah, that is a very interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm kind of double-minded on this. I think one of the, th I'm a proponent for being self-aware, right? And in my self-awareness, I can understand that I can be double-minded on things, right? So I can be 50-50 on things. Um, as an educator, should you be aware 
of that the presence of this trauma and that it it will inform on how what you're teaching will be received yes on the flip side of that when we're talking about educating white students it's that same idea that folks are using as an excuse to not allow us to teach the truth of what's happening and what has happened with history, right? So you're in a very difficult position in that as a social studies teacher, you of course are teaching a subject that is gonna be an entry point to this history, to some of these social conversations, um, so how do you start to educate while keeping those things in mind and keeping them age appropriate? I'm not sure. I think pre just presenting facts and I think presenting them in the way that the preface is always, these, this is just what happened, okay? A lot of times I think, because I'm an educator too, a lot of people don't, consider librarians as educators, but I'm a whole information professional, right? So I'm feeding you, I'm feeding you know, classroom educators. I was one of those too, though. Um, I was a professor at a university. So we're feeding this to you, right, as a librarian. How I would approach it is, okay, this is, we're gonna talk about these following subjects, okay? Within these subjects, you're gonna see these themes, okay? Some of these things may cause some feelings, um, during the process of talking about these things, I would recommend as a way to be aware of what they may absorb and may feel from these facts, because you're presenting facts, right? Take breaks. Be like, okay, let's check in. Is everyone, how are you feeling? Let's do breath work. I'm a huge fan of breath work. Um, you know, Let's get some water, let's stand up, let's stretch in between these things that we're talking about. Um, open up the dialogue. I would recommend, I know teachers are, y'all y'all's loads are already heavy. I would recommend offering some sort of session or time with caregivers and where they are made aware of what is being talked about, but they're also being made of ways that they can help to foster some of that aftercare that's necessary. A lot of times when we're teaching students these things that, that happened and that are rooted in trauma, we don't consider those feelings that they're taking home. And we don't consider the fact that we can arm caregivers with tools to um, help their children talk through these emotions that may have come up. Um, I think that's a huge piece that's missing. And I think that will lend itself um, to opening up not just the children, but the caregivers into um, promoting healing and care while all this education is happening. So many times, especially with teachers, y'all are forced to teach to a curriculum, teach to a test without consideration of the social emotional learning aspect okay I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm starting my PhD soon like in September so I'm trying to dive into all these fancy words um, <laughs> but all that to say I think that there is um, room for presenting the facts but then having aftercare and having that very intentional awareness that some of these things are gonna be disturbing, they're gonna cause feelings. Um, and as an educator, you, while you're presenting these things and while y'all are working through these things together, you'll be healing with them and be transparent with them about that too. Like we as adults, we gotta do better with being transparent about our feelings um, and how it feels to present this stuff. My, I have a daughter, my daughter is about to be 20. And she regularly is like, mom, are you okay? Are you good? I know, you know, today was rough. I told her I was doing this and she's like, I'm gonna leave you alone when you get home. <laughs> but I think that, that promotion of, we can have both. We can talk about the nitty gritty. We can talk about the facts as they happen, but we can also talk about the feelings. We can talk about how we felt. Um, we can talk about 
our perspectives and our lenses and just be transparent and open with the children in our care and with caregivers about the necessity for talking through these things. I think that actually will um, open up a lot of folks to more wanting to learn more and their children wanting to learn more if they feel that they are cared for while discussing these very difficult subjects. I don't know if I answered your question, but okay. What's your name again, family? Joshua. Are you from Colorado? Where were you, what school did you go to? Okay, that's what's up. I went to uh, Loyola, right, right across from City Park. So I, I know the Catholic school experience. I'm with you, family. Um, so he, here's the thing. You are a rarity as being a male inside of the classroom to begin with. You already like a what is that? Yeah, you're a unicorn in there. So I want to applaud you because both young girls and young boys need to see more men inside of the classroom. With that being said, you're asking a question about having the opportunity for the entry point. Having nine children, having worked inside of DPS, APS, I am very keen that you are not going to be able to transmit anything to children that you yourself are not able to do or are doing actively yourself. So then my question to you is, what is your own relationship with healing? Right? You have one? Do you feel like you have an active healing journey going on for yourself? Okay. Oh, that's juicy. But you know what? You know why that's so juicy? Because you are still externalizing it. There's an African proverb that said that if we defeat the enemy within, the enemy without can do us no harm. Let me say that one more again. If we defeat the enemy within, the enemy without can do us no harm. So when I'm asking you what your healing journey is, you're like, yeah, I, been, I cussed a few folks out that I felt like needed to get these hands, but I needed to be brave. So I went to, I'm asking, have you done that with you? Have you confronted your, your bully in you, right? Because the whole reason why you even questioned it in the first place is because you may have not thought that you were courageous enough. What voice was that that said you weren't courageous enough? Who's that? Do you understand what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is that the best thing, the way that children learn, uh, uh, my favorite quote, and I'm a butcher it, comes behind uh, uh, James Baldwin that says, children uh, may or may not listen to adults, but they never failed, he, they never failed to emulate them. They may or may not listen to what you tell them to do, but they're not going to fail doing what they see you do. So I say that to say that the way that we actually educate human beings in the Afro-Indigenous culture, and when I say Afro-Indigenous, when I'm talking about Indigenous, I'm talking about those of you who are Irish, who are German, who are Jewish, you are Indigenous to your land as well. So that's what I mean. And they, there's a set of practices, healing practices, that mostly women on those lands conducted to the detriment of their lives at a given point, right? That's what the witch, pro but that's a whole nother story, another whole nother Oprah, as they say. As I was saying to you, brother, you need, you, in my judgment, I would suggest that you be deeply involved in your own personal healing practice. 
And there are people who come from your particular culture that hold the seeds of what that looks like. So you don't have to just, you know, I, I've done uh, Lakota sweats. I've done, uh, uh, um, uh, worked with Nigerian, uh, Igbo, and Yoruba. I've done, there's, there's a, there's, your culture holds the seeds for your healing journey. So you ain't gotta start from scratch. You can, you just don't have to. So my suggestion is take your children on the journey with you. As you are moving into your healing journey, what would it be like to look at social studies through the healing journey lens? Do you understand what I'm saying? That way, they will always feel empowered. You look at history, so many times black history has talked to black people that it started in slavery, right? That we were downtrodden, like, after watching Roots, Roots is depressing, I'm sure. But what I'm saying, that's a Western telling of history of what happened in the Ma'afa, what happened in the African transatlantic slave trade. That's a Western telling of that, even if it's written by a black man. It's a Western telling of it. If, I, if a healer were to tell that story, what they would say is, listen, we were running this planet for thousands of years. And that as everything rises, some days it must fall. And so now we're in a dark phase. We are in a fallen phase. But there are you who are hearing my voice that are here to become the healers of your people and guide them to the space when we're back inside of the light again. And so we're going to go on a journey for this next semester, going through talking about things that have happened to us, not from the perspective of being beaten and trodden and oppressed, but from the perspective that I am a person and a being of light will always be one, was always one, and will be, do you understand what I'm saying? Teach history from a cultural perspective that the human being is just part of the process, that we are that we are spiritual beings having a human experience and that our ancestors are alive with us and so that they are walking with us listen we can sit down and chat about it what i'm saying though is that you have to teach history from a non-western perspective else our dead folks are dead folks All right, y'all, um, we have reached past our time. And one other piece that I wanted to name for the social studies teacher to consider for your curriculum, calling back in uh, Dr. Vincent Harding's work, there's a river. Because talk about uh, a perspective on history that talks about our constant fight towards liberation and not just oppression. Yeah, he, he definitely articulated that, you know. There is a River by Dr. Vincent Harding. Mm -hmm. And he's local too. And, mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. Yeah, at the Live School of Theology, every year they have Dr. Vincent Harding Day in memory of, of his passing. So again, like that connection of like, either people are dead or they're your ancestors, right? Um, and I think the other thing I would say to even this last question, this past questions, is that it's important for us to continue to be curious and reflective and to create that space of reflection. So that's my invitation to you all. Like we went through a lot in this time together. And so I invite you to check in with yourself. Like how are you feeling as you leave our space? What's, what's staying on your mind, on your heart, on your spirit? Um, so all of that. Well, thank you so much again to our amazing panelists. Absolutely. Thanks again to the Colorado Trust for financially supporting the series, to WAFA and coordinating all of the logistics, especially feeding us. Please take some food with you. Yes. 
<laughs> um, and thank you so much to Regis and the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Excellence for supporting us um, to access the space here. Thank you to Open Media Foundation and Brandon holding down AV for us today, our interpretation team, uh, the Community Language Cooperative, and Valentina still holding it down on the Zoom. Um, and thank you to each one of you who are here and who are virtually here because this is part of it. This is part of how we continue to spread what we understand and what we know and continue to build power. Um, you're invited to continue to join us for this series. Our next one will be on September 14th on the San Luis land rights struggle. Um, we will have Dr. Nikki Gonzalez um, as well as Shirley Romero, who is a core leader of that movement, um, sharing a lot of wisdom there. If you know any folks in rural communities that need some inspiration, this is a great session to invite them to. Um, we'll also have a session on the Chicano movement. Nita Gonzalez, um, the daughter of Corky Gonzalez, who is one of the founders of the Crusade for Justice, will be on that panel. Um, and there's uh, other folks being confirmed for that. And we'll also have a pretty robust conversation on um, the American Indian movement with indigenous leaders here in our Colorado community. So um, I hope to see you in a month's time. Um, and uh, feel free to, again, take some food. And please have a safe and good evening. Thanks for being here.